To start off today, what I thought I'd do is just kind of talk a little bit about consumer trends and how they're driving retail. Uh, as you guys know, I do a good amount in the retail space, so I feel pretty abreast about trends in the market, especially here regionally. Uh, but here's just some of the national trends that they're starting to see. Last week, I think we had an article that kind of highlighted the, the, the differences between what jo Dollar General is doing versus Family Dollar. Uh, so, you know, do obviously Dollar General is still actively expanding their footprint across the country. I think they're trying to shoot for 20,000 stores throughout the country. Aldi has made a big push in the market, which I think is great, uh, just to increase competition uh, in a ver for a variety of different grocers. Hopefully that leads to more, you know, affordable groceries all across the country. You know, Walmart and other concepts as well are starting to try to get more, modify their footprint within uh, the space and coming up with new layouts and different concepts. So that's obviously going to be very beneficial. You know, there's there's also a lot of newer, not necessarily newer concepts, but, you know, these, these convenience stores slash gas station change. You know, if, if I know Chad in Canada, I'm not sure if they have a similar type of concept, but there's a, a concept here called Wawa's, which is especially very popular in really the Southwest and East Coast area. Um, and that there are these pretty large convenience stores that also are gas stations as well. So they're just well known and people will go out of their way to go to these stores and they have additional things that, that draw them in. So they have like food that they offer that's unique to that particular location. I'm, I'm a big so, Wawa guy. I'm a big huh? Wawa guy. I will pass 10 gas stations to go to a Wawa. <laughs> exactly. <Okay>. Exactly. It's, <laughs> it's kind of like a cult following. So it's kind of cool to see that be the case. And, and you know, for whatever reason, I don't know, I, I, I still don't really understand, but a lot of these like take fives or oil change concepts are, are super popular. You see them being traded all the time on the triple net investment market. You know, auto zones, that sort of thing are also very popular and they're continuing to expand. So and then also the, the the fitness type of concepts have been really active, especially as you start talking about, you know, the, the higher price point per month. You know, it, it just seems to be ones that are continuing to increase their footprint. I think it's just more people are being more health conscious, especially the younger generations are tends to be a little bit more health conscious. So they're typically consuming products that are more quote unquote healthy and they're going to the gym more, which is a good positive trend. But again, it just kind of leads itself into, you know, the the, the demands for retail. So I, I thought I'd just kind of open it up to the group and uh, kind of get their thoughts, get your all's thoughts on it. Yeah, we don't have those big uh, stores like that in Canada, although it probably do quite well here too. What do you guys think on the EV trend? And it, I know in the US, there's discussion about wanting to have internal combustion engines uh, be banned by 2032 or perhaps not banned but any new EV, any new vehicles after 2032 have to either be hybrid or EV and we've got similar stuff in Canada what do you think the implications of that are long term for gas stations or is there just going to be so many vehicles on the road for so long that that this probably isn't going to be a problem for decades. Yeah, I don't think it's going to be a problem for a while, personally. Yeah. And I also think that, you know, even in a scenario where you have EVs, they're going to have to stop in some capacity. And, and usually the stops are going to be for longer. So I'm assuming, you know, these gas stations or convenience store concepts or what we perceive to be gas stations will likely eventually have like a lounge area. You know, I have a buddy who owns a, a, a rental car lot. They do Turo, which is a, I don't know if you're familiar with the concept, but it's a rental car. It's like a, like a Uber for rental cars. You go rent a, a car on the platform and then go pick it up. They sometimes they'll drop it off to you. And he's looking to do a charging station for his electric cars. And then he, his wife owns a kind of a smoothie concept. And so he's built out like a little mm -hmm. nook for her and then have a little lounge there where his people can go and sit. And if they want a smoothie, they can grab a smoothie. The charging time timeline, it, you, there's only so fast you can charge a battery, right? At least currently, maybe there's new advancement in technology that, it, that improves that. But I don't know based on the current technology that that's even possible to do in a very, very compressed time frame without actually swapping out the battery, which is not necessarily the, you well, know. they're not, they're not forever. They don't take too long right now i mean like i think like right now you might be looking at somewhere between like 30 and an hour 30 you know for the really long ones but yeah i think that i think you're probably fine on a gas station investment for probably another 30 ish years overall i mean i i i don't even think we're even in 30 years from now i i still think we'll uh we'll have plenty of gas powered vehicles uh as much as the government might try to push for uh us to uh try to do it sooner than makes even sense at this point but in regards to, I think the layout would definitely be different. I agree with you, uh, Raphael, where I think uh, they're going to have to get very unique, you know, where they're going to have to make it almost like destination, like just a, a Wawa and building up the uh, the culture, the cult-like following is not going to be enough. You're going to have to uh, build out, like it's like the rest stops almost. Yeah, they're like and, lounges. I, yeah. I, I guarantee you there's going to be things that pop up. It's like, oh yeah, you put your charger car for half an hour. Maybe there's a little coffee shop in there and there's like other stuff you can do while you're there. Cigars, so kind of an experience bar, type. 
Yeah, but these but these gas stations are in great locations. So it's not that the location is going to be unvaluable. Of course, it's going to be valuable. You're just going to have to retrofit it to support additional, you know, charging stations. Yeah, so plus I, charging st- plus charging might be like thirty seconds in thirty years if it's going to maintain its 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 standard as a lithium ion battery. Because really, I, from my understanding of the battery technology, they're just stacking these batteries on top of each other. Like it's you know it's just the density of which they're utilizing these. You know, it, it's it's just essentially the the greater part of the vehicle is is con- is comprised of the actual battery itself. So unless yeah. they improve the technology to a point where they're not even using some of this, and again, this is. I'm not I'm not a, a battery engineer, so I can't really comment on that. But as they currently stand today, the technology was is just not supportive of that. So yeah, I have to imagine in three decades we're probably going to be at a very different. The dollar trees will be ten dollar trees. There there'll be a lot of um, s- slight adjustments and things that uh, I think will even still be around. I mean, who knows if even retail will be a thing? We'll be in the sky, and retail mm-hmm. will be. 30 stories high. We, just, we need to tag Elon Musk on this on this chat so he, he can kind of provide us some context there. Why don't we talk about retail on Mars, okay? Yeah. I think the real, <laughs> the real question is who's going to be the first investor to buy up some streets and start developing on Mars? Definitely. Well, I, I appreciate your guys' commentary there. I'll go ahead and push us to the, the next article, which is... This is a sad story, ultimately, because that ship that crashed mm-hmm. into the Key Bridge in Baltimore uh, killed six people. So incredibly sad story. But the takeaway in this interesting article here shows that when they built the key bridge in the 70s, I believe it was, the average size was of a of a container ship was 3,000 TEUs. And TEU just stands for 20-foot equivalent unit. That's a smaller shipping container. Most of the ones that you'd actually see in real life are 40-foot FEUs, 40-foot equivalent units, but they use the TEU. It's just become an industry standard. That's what everything gets measured in is TEUs. So the ship when the ship size when they built that bridge was 3,000 TEUs. As it's progressed now and you have these Supermax and Panamax container ships, some of these hold 24,000 TEUs. So compare like one that was 3,000 to 24,000. These ships have just become so enormous. The one that crashed into the key bridge was actually 10,000 TEUs. So still three times as big uh, as the original one, but a lot of the infrastructure in the US and globally just wasn't built with these massive container ships in being considered. So they weren't engineered for that. They weren't, there was no expectation that container ships would grow to the size that they have. And that's really put stress on the entire global supply chain. You've got uh, stress on the Panama Canal uh, because these ships became so large that they actually had to increase the lock size. That's complicated right now with drought and uh, Gatun Lake and some of the issues that Panama's having. Suez, same thing. There's issues with the with the Suez Canal for geopolitical reasons. But you start looking at how fast the industry has evolved to have these super massive ships now where a lot of that existing infrastructure wasn't built for that. Uh, it really does underscore a lot of constraints and real bottlenecks. The Panama Canal is a real bottleneck in the supply chain, uh, but it really does show that uh, the shipping industry has has evolved so quickly, but the rest of the industry, which is much slower to respond and adapt, uh, hasn't been able to catch up. So it's that's leading to things like that, the tragedy in, in Baltimore, and then just global delays in shipping supplies uh, as everyone's trying to figure out how to work around these massive ships now. I actually had no idea the size of these things. I mean, like this is... Yeah. This is insanity. Look at, yeah, look at I mean, how stacking these. I mean, the stacking the containers is unbelievable. I know it's like it's like the most amazing Jenga formation we've ever seen. You know, like immediately people go to conspiracy, which I'm not a conspiracy theorist, so I'm not going to dive too much into it. But why all this type of stuff about the ability or um, how it's affecting now the cost of you know literally you know everything you can possibly imagine, how it's just destroying the supply chain in so many different fashions. As soon as things start getting better at the supply chain, they make an issue where this is one of those things where if you want to get, I'm not going to get political, I'm not going to get all this type of stuff, but it's one of those things where infrastructure 
and development thoughts for 20, 30, 40 years down the road come into play where it's like, okay, now guess what happens to all the real estate right around that bridge for the next four years, where it's like that gas station, as an example, right on the corner of one other side of that bridge, right when they come over the other side is now going to have a 50% less demand or substantially less demand. It's like, how much does that real estate get affected right next to uh, the bridge where all these cars are pulling off? You know, those coffee shops, those gas stations, those you know, small mom and pop retail stores were like, they, they were, de- they were relying on people from across the bridge coming over and stopping for coffee or whatever, where now it's like, you know, you gotta, you know, kind of shift and adapt as fast as possible. Where like, Hey, the properties that are being directly affected now are going to be an interesting opportunity for possible investment. hundred percent. And really, I mean, how crippling is this for the city of Baltimore? It's just really Super. sad to see because it's going to lock down the canal for, I mean, it's going to lock down the, the river for quite some time as they start to clean up the debris. And then at a certain point, they're going to have to go through the construction process. So I'm assuming that's going to also affect barge traffic throughout that. They were saying several canal. years. Oh yeah. And, mm-hmm. and, and also, you know, the way we transport, the, the cheapest ways to transport product is obviously by barge, but also by truck. So trucking traffic all, along the bridge was, I'm assuming, pretty significant. I mean, this thing was a mile and a half. This is like a significantly long bridge. It's not a standard, well, standard, whatever you call standard. I mean, here in Louisville, our, our bridges are nowhere near a mile and a half, two miles long. But, you know, obviously in certain certain areas that that's it was required a mile and a half body water. That's, is that what they seriously I said? believe that's what it was. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure it was a pretty long. It was a long bridge. It was not a it was not a just a puddle jumper. It was a, it was a significantly long bridge. It's that, one point six mile. Yeah. So so it's a it's, it's, it's a big impact. It's a big impact. And, and, and you know, I, that's that's one of the things that's really the sad thing. Obviously, the the, the, the loss of life is is the, the most impacted and, and sad thing about it. But also the existing residents. I mean, it's going to affect that city for a long period of time. Hopefully over time, they're able to to bounce back from it, but it's definitely not a, I mean, if you cut off a major line of transportation for a city, you know, especially one the size of Baltimore, it's definitely going to affect them long-term. So. Wow. And not just Baltimore, it's going to affect everything because oh, yeah. Baltimore is still a major trade route. So there's a lot of things that would come in and, and go across that bridge, like you said, by truck. Uh, so barge traffic is going to be impeded. Truck traffic is going to be impeded. It's probably going to cause some bottlenecks just in the East East coast. Uh, so that'll cause ships to have to reroute to other ports. Now it'll cause trucking companies have to figure out other routes that they're going to run things. And none of those options are going to be as efficient as what was already in place. So it's, it's has broad implications for uh, Baltimore first and foremost, but also just trade in the Eastern coast together. In Baltimore it is, is it one of the bigger shipping ports in, in the East coast? Isn't, is it, is it not? Yeah. yeah. I, I, from a traffic standpoint, I, I would think, New York's port, Savannah, Charleston, uh, I, th- I would think that in Jacksonville, I would think that those would be the main ones, but Baltimore is certainly up there. There's still a sizable amount of traffic that comes into that port. I'm trying to do the, I'm trying, I mean, like I'm trying to bring it up on my phone of like the, uh, the bridge here in the port, just to understand like how much actual difference is it in, uh, in time frame? Uh, cause I'm, I'm curious what the drastic the drastic shift in time frame is like if you're right across the bridge, which honestly, like I'm looking at it right now. I guess if you lived here, I, I'm curious, like what the like the you know the detour now. Like if you have to, you know, still go across and like how how long that would take if I tried to pin it. Yeah, um, and, and and it's it's amazing to see the impact of a bridge being built and how that can lead to a bunch of different commercial activity in an area. I mean. They built several bridges here over time, and you see historical photos of when the bridge wasn't there, and then all of a sudden, when the bridge comes, if if you have a you know five year time lapse or ten year time lapse, this thing just like it creates it, it, it's it's truly amazing to see the the impact. And I'm assuming this is going to have a reverse effect for them, unfortunately. Um, but it, it's it is what it is. Hopefully, we'll we'll be we'll be hoping for Baltimore, and and hopefully that continues to progress. But all right, so next up is Henry's article. This is um this is is interesting to me. Um, you know, I'm. A multifamily investor of a few um, apartment buildings that I own. And this is very interesting uh, looking into what markets here are drastically getting affected by rent growth. Miami, there is so many apartments. I mean, it's just unbelievable the amount of construction, like for new stuff, how much stuff is on the market. I mean, like these places are competing, yet every single time a lease term comes up, because I talk to everybody around here, I'm always curious, like the amount of money that they try to raise your rent is substantial. I mean, in my, I mean, Florida has no rent control. I'm a big fan of no rent control, but I think it's very interesting when you start to look at some of these markets here, looking at what's in the pipeline. I mean, you could see here, this is for, you know, again, four and five star 
luxury buildings and the red growth, which is very interesting. We have not seen this. I mean, please tell me if I'm wrong. I don't know if you guys have seen it uh, differently than I have, but I don't know when the last time we ever had negative rent growth like this before. Where yeah, At least recently, at least recently. At yeah. least recently. Yeah. In the last decade or so, like I'm really, uh, I am unaware of a time frame in which we actually went backwards, right? And rank growth, especially for these types of quality buildings where, I mean, we still have, and we still have a ton of product to hit the market still, right? I mean, if you just go down the list, I mean, look at, look at the amount of under construction units at Austin, right? They have six negative, almost 6% negative rent growth, and they still have another 36,000 units coming online. Wow. You know, our completions, they have 20,000, uh, 20,800 coming up this year. I mean, it's just wild to see how much product is coming up on the market. I'm curious though, what is, uh, you know, for you guys, you know, are you somebody who's still super bullish on rent? I mean, as much as I'm seeing all this, I'm still super bullish on rent over the next few years. I still think rent will start moving in the right, uh, we'll start still going up, but I think it will be on a, we're going to be on a heavy plateau for probably the next few years. Well, um, the rates, uh, interest rates are high. Yeah. And, wa and wages have to catch up too. I mean, wages exactly. are starting to normalize. I mean, I think the biggest thing is this is, this is four and five star product. So we're talking probably in Austin in particular, and some of these other markets, we're probably talking, you know, for a standard one, two bedroom. I mean, what do you pay? What do you pay in Miami for a two bedroom apartment? Like five grand? Yeah. So the, um, I mean, typically what I'm seeing is like two to two to 4,000, depending on quality for a one bed, you know, uh, call it four to eight, four to 10, four to 15 yeah. for two beds. So five, four to five star products. So really you're probably looking at the upper echelon of that. If yeah. I had to guess, I mean, if you're talking newer, no, four, if, I mean, look, there's some two or one bedroom product for 15 grand a month out here in my, and it's just stupid. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, at, at a certain point you run out of people who can afford to pay that. I mean, it, it is what it is. I mean, there's only, a, there's only, a, I mean, you have to be making well over six figures to afford a four or $5,000 a month rent. And so, it, you know, if, if the, the jobs aren't available to support that and granted right now, interest rates are higher. So, you know, the, the, the possibility to buy a house, in particular in these higher, these higher cost markets, it's, it's very difficult for a lot of people to get into new homes uh, nowadays. But at a certain point, there, there's there's a balancing act because you if, if I'm going to if I make, let's call it 100 grand a year and, you know, I'm in a department that make uh, that's five grand a month. I mean, that's like 60 grand. I mean, you can't, you can't afford that. So you might as well go down to the C class product or maybe a lower B class product and maybe pay a little bit less. So well, well you know, four grand a month, if you play the, what is it called? The one third rule, right? When you're qualifying somebody, I mean, making mm -hmm. three X, three X, the uh, monthly rent. So that's $12,000 a month, $144,000 a year uh, gross to qualify for a 4k unit. I mean, it's just crazy. Chad, what are you seeing in your market? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's fairly consistent. Like, I, I think that this is probably on the higher end, like you mentioned, where it's not indicative of the market as a whole. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do think that... That is for sure. Multi I agree with that. <clears throat> but multifamily has stagnated. Like, you're not hearing many stories of, of actual rent growth. If anything, there's pressure, or maybe perhaps even some downward pressure on rents right now. And what I'm really interested in following is all these investors that syndicated deals mm -hmm. and how aggressive they got with their pro formas. Uh, because I'm sure you guys see this all the time as well. Like you, you get a, a w eyes wide open, a really aggressive investor who wants to scale and he paints this rosy picture and he goes and raises money through a fund or just through a GPLP model buys a bunch of property, gets everyone excited, but his pro forma is probably anticipating a certain amount of growth. And his pro forma probably didn't include interest rates going up or at least staying where they're at. So you have that double, and so actually three pressures. You've got pressure on your rents, or at least you're not getting that uptick that you'd probably hoped for. You've got pressure on your interest rates on your debt, and then you're probably getting upward pre a pressure on your expenses. Property taxes, insurance is problematic right now. Everything has just become more expensive. So what I, I'm really curious to see if we're going to see some distressed sales uh, this year, just because investors were way too bullish on their expectations on revenue and too dovish on their expenses. So that, that's what I'm really going to be curious to is there's just too, so many investors that are over leveraged and had too rosy of an anticipations. I mean, it's already, I actually have uh, a couple friends of mine who are already taking full advantage of that and getting fantastic deals where they just have to come in and take on an assumption, right? I mean, they're basically mm -hmm. getting for the debt cost that these people were in it for because, you know, they're over, they were over, um, 
you know, way over their heads with their purchase and the equity overall. And the, you know, the properties aren't worth what they thought it was worth anymore. And they have good relationships with their, those uh, local banks. So yeah, huge opportunity to basically take advantage of what uh, very unexperienced syndicators were taking, you know, trying to do not realizing that, hey, rents don't always increase. Definitely a, a good point there. All right. So next up is a BizNow article regarding everyone knows elections impact CRE, but does the data back it up? So I know we've talked about it a lot of times where people say, oh, it's this is an election year. And you know because of this, this is what we think is going to happen. And so this article kind of tackles that that question and sees if there's actually any discernible impact. And what they found is that there's really no indication that because of an election year that transaction volume in the commercial real estate space increases, decreases, or does really anything outside of a, uh, a, a, a standard deviation, essentially. So part of this article is they kind of talk a little bit about, you know, the, the impact of some of the, the things that have happened in Congress. Uh, this is obviously on the U.S. side. Uh, but but really, the, the biggest impacts, understandably, are ones that are directly tied to the real estate space. So they talk a little bit about the Opportunity Zone law and how that potentially impacted and created opportunities for, for development in a variety of different blighted areas around the country. So that obviously had a significant impact in people's willingness to invest dollars in those types of areas. Capital gain tax reform was also a big driver in the space and led to a lot of people being willing to take to sell property so that they could replace that capital elsewhere and not incur as much on the capital gain tax side. And really just you know a variety of different other factors related to uh, fiscal policy in particular um, that obviously benefited the commercial real estate industry. So the moral of this particular article was that no, there, there isn't any discernible impact from it being an election year and how this is going to impact commercial real estate, but policy is really what drives it. So that's kind of the, the gist of the article. So I figured I'd uh, start the dialogue here. I know it can get... Um... Well, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm happy to uh, jump in first being over. outside of the US. So I could, mm -hmm. I could talk to this pretty objectively. I wouldn't vote for Biden if I was in the US. He would not be someone that I support. That doesn't necessarily mean I'm pro-Republican or anti-Democrat. It's just I'm anti-Joe Biden. But even saying that, he's done some great things for the U.S. recently. The CHIPS yeah. Act, I shouldn't say for the U.S., for segments of the U.S. have benefited quite well. The CHIPS Act, the Inflation Reduction Act, that's injected a considerable amount of money into the manufacturing space. So that whole reshoring, onshoring, nearshoring trend, that's brought a considerable amount of money back into the U.S. And it goes even beyond traditional manufacturing. You guys are seeing a ton of EV plants going up, a ton of gigafactories, the battery plants. Uh, but one that, that I think is probably the most impactful is semiconductors. So right now, Taiwan basically controls 90% of the high-end semiconductors. They've got a near monopoly on that production. And there's a ton of geopolitical risk that comes with China and whatever they decide to do with Taiwan at some point down the road. That could cause a severe, massive, life-changing for all of us shortage in the semiconductor uh, space. So uh, TSCM, the, which is based out of Taiwan's biggest uh, semiconductor uh, manufacturer, they're building a huge $40 billion facility just outside of Phoenix, where they're going to try to replicate what they're doing in Taiwan. And that's made possible because of the CHIPS Act and other some of the uh, financial incentives that the government's putting in. So I, I think that that perhaps reinforces, or at least in my mind, reinforces the idea that we could always be a little agnostic on what the government is doing. Uh, because I wouldn't vote for Joe Biden. I, I wouldn't support Joe Biden. But I have to support those plans because they've had a tremendous impact on yeah. North America. I've said this to people uh, in the past as well is, you can't, you can't control the government. So we, we can, we can try to be as involved as we can in it. You could try to lobby people and perhaps get people to vote, but the chances of having a meaningful impact to sway something is, is hopelessly naive. So instead, I think it's just much more productive to spend your time that you'd otherwise complain about politics. And I, I, like I could complain about Joe Biden, probably we could donate, devote an entire show to me complaining about Joe Biden. But I do have to recognize that he's done some good things. So instead of me complaining about him or like even worrying what's happened with it, like take that time and just do something more productive with it. Reach out to a 
client that you haven't talked to in, in a year and have a 15 minute conversation with them uh, about what's happening in their business. And that 15 minutes is so much better served than complaining about politics to either people that already agree with you. So you're in a little bit of an echo chamber or trying to convince someone that's not going to listen to you anyways. There's just nothing productive that comes from it. So no. I, maybe that's kind of like a full summary of no, the article is that there's just nothing. I appreciate comes that. And I, that's what I was kind of hoping to get at through the article is that at the end of the day, what it comes down to is that supporting policy that it doesn't matter who it is like like you said you could you could have one affiliation one way or the other but at the end of the day i'm agnostic to the the whole political scene more so it's just what is going to support industry in you know in our case the united states what's going to support industry in canada because at the end of the day the the greatest revelation in in my opinion in recent human history is capitalism being able to create opportunity for people to bring people out of, of poverty i mean that that's that in my opinion is what i'm all about is being able to support individuals who want to make an make make a life for themselves and their families and getting out of the way of those individuals that want to do that because at the end of the day we're here to provide a great life for our family and hopefully you're able to do that and if you're in an environment where that's a that's supported obviously that's that's the best thing possible so yeah look i, I agree 100 percent, and i love that you're getting political makes me very happy we, we <laughs> agree we agree a lot yeah. well, I'll, 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 I'll go on this. you threw it up henry be like oh yeah <laughs> yes i love it i love it man i love it yeah I, listen i did not vote for him the first time i would not vote for him this second time getting trump in office or not like not not it doesn't matter of which way it goes. They have so little say on the things that actually drastically affect the real estate world. I agree. Like, look, look, if they're talking about capital gains tax, if they're talking about, you know, you know, things like the CHIPS Act, if they're talking about things that have specific direct possible impacts on what we do, sure. Am I going to be for, against, whatever, you know, uh, towards those specific acts? Yeah, but that's not sp something specific that I even believe that Joe Biden was like, you know what we need to do? We need to, you know, reinforce the CHIPS Act. Not at all. I, somebody else made the decision there. What I do believe is that Things like the interest rates and stuff like that, which again have nothing to do with the policy. You know, like the president, like you know, Trump, Trump could have been for four last four years and for the next four, as an example. And maybe or maybe not, um, they uh, the the interest rates would be the exact same, right? It wouldn't have, you know, who knows, right? So it's not like he has complete control, or the president in general has complete control over that. So yeah, I, I'm with you. Just you know, it's like who cares the president? Like, no, don't be wrong. I care who the heck the president is, but I'm saying it. Don't let it affect the way you do your business. Because it's like, you know, it, it's like blaming the rain because you can't go out and show a property. I mean, like, it doesn't make any freaking sense. All right. So next up, I, I, I'm looking forward to this particular article because, okay. you know, this is something we've talked about on the podcast many times. We've fallen closely. So I'm excited to hear. Uh, yeah. So the next update on this, the next update of WeWork, they're finally getting out of bankruptcy. This is going to be interesting. And what I also thought was also super interesting, they renegotiated all their debt, which was really soft bank. Right. Uh, there wasn't anybody else, really. But they're coming out of bankruptcy with around 300 locations left. I don't know what the total number was of, uh, originally, but it says in the second order, the se second line here, the New York based company said Tuesday in the same and reached a significant milestone of settling on the fates of a, some uh, 450 unspecified locations in a move that signals WeWork's months long process of negotiating with landlords is nearing an end. So, you know, the renegotiation of rents in the case of about half of its 300 sites um, with the others not facing uh, changes in terms because they are what a WeWork spokesperson describes as a co-star as strong performers. WeWork is also ex uh, exiting another 150 locations. So uh, basically what I had read here was they basically have rid all their debt or they have plans to rid all their personal, like the, uh, the company's debt, not like real estate owned debt, but more so the debt that they own investors. Okay, specifically SoftBank. And they're going to be coming out of bankruptcy with about 300 locations. So very interesting. And if you look at the very, very bottom here, Adam Newman, the, the psychopath who put this whole monster together, this man is trying to buy back his uh, his baby, his long lost deranged second or, 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 or demon child. Uh, he's trying to buy it back from bankruptcy for $500 million, which he basically ran off with anyways. I mean, God bless this guy. You know, what what an amazing thing. You, you know, build a company that makes no money and you walk away with billions of dollars after it and you're going to buy it back and you're going to run into the ground. I'm actually, I'm actually curious, not only to get your opinion on rework and uh, rework of what your thoughts are going forward, but also does anybody have any idea how Flow, his BS company, is now going? I'm curious to understand because apparently now he's the syndicator. You know, he's a he's a GP on a bunch of multifamily deals, which I'm sure he's going to somehow bring to investors and try to sell it to them like it's a tech company. 
and uh, we're going to see the whole thing happen again. Buying it back may be a good uh, good move on his part. I mean, it it may very well be you know in a much better cash position now that you know they've renegotiated all these different leases, and and there are definitely WeWork lo- locations that were making money. I mean, there's there's no doubt. It's just you know they they overextended, and and like you said, they were they were billed as a, a tech company when in reality they were just a shared working space. And really, I mean, you got to you got to hand it to Adam Newman. I mean, he 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 took SoftBank to the cleaners. Um, but it is what it is, you know. Yeah, I've uh, we ran out of coffee mugs uh, at my office, so I <laughs> nice. I had to go digging through the cupboards to find one, and I happened coincidentally found this uh, WeWork mug. Just I, I in with, time. Just in time. I agree <laughs> with everything you're saying. It's uh, it, it it was billed as a tech company when it wasn't. There is nothing proprietary about what they were doing. They I think that the model could work. I think that they created a really cool brand. If you thought co-working space, WeWork was the name that came up. So they actually did create a pretty powerful brand. And I think if they would have been more responsible and diligent in opening up locations strategically, as opposed to just going into a market and saying, well, we need to at least 5 million square feet here because it's a big market. I think if they would have actually taken a more measured and calculated approach to saying, okay, well here, now we've hit our demand here. This is a standalone office building that's going to work for us. Let's add another one now. Uh, But they just went out, they took all of SoftBank's money basically and deployed it into leases and Adam owned some of the buildings that he was leasing. Mm It's just ridiculous. Like, yeah, he. I mean, he he fleeced them good, uh, and to think that someone's going to lend that guy five hundred million dollars to do this again—that's just crazy to me. Even if it's worth five hundred million, even if it's worth a billion, if somebody lends that guy money, we need to see interest rates go to twenty percent because it's just craziness. <laughs> yeah, I want to. I want to work with the investors who are going to lend Adam, Adam Newman of all people money. I'd love to work with that person. One of the expectations of SoftBank when he, when they when they took a, a significant position in the company was rapid expansion. So. You know, it it was kind of a, a perfect storm of different events that transpired. But I think we all know the the, the inner workings of things that have happened. And this is all that's the things that have come out about what has happened even prior to you know them going and becoming what they were. Uh, and and granted, we also have to factor in the fact that no one could have predicted what happened with COVID and the impact it would have had on the office market. So you know there is a, t- a tinge. But, of- but I am curious, right? Like if we just call a spade a spade, right? And I don't need to spend too much time talking about WeWork and all of Adam Newman's crazy king auctions. But I am curious if. COVID- COVID never occurred, okay? Things went on the way they were beforehand. Do you believe the same thing would have happened? Eventually. I eventually. I, I think it would have gone on for a while, though. I mean, it, you know, really, I mean, and I'm not I'm not comparing well, the two. They were losing money you know, hand over fist, though. Yeah, sure. But 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 I'm not even comparing the two. But Bertie Madoff would never have gotten caught if the financial crisis, if it wasn't crisis hadn't away. happened. And I'm not comparing the two, so let me be let me be clear about I that. I think we should. I think I we should. should. <laughs> I second that. Yeah. yeah, but but again, it's it's just one of those things where it's like, yeah, there's there's a trigger event that occurs that leads to this downfall. I mean, I had a lot of friends that were big into Theranos before you know that whole thing came out. I had some buddies that really wanted to work for the company because they thought it was an innovative thing, and then all of a sudden the, the house of cards came trashing down. So I know. honestly am just freaking mind blown of all these crazy stories. It all sounds like the Michigan stuff that you hear, like the you know what is it called? Uh, you know, man, it's like the Netflix specials that people come up with these crazy things that people follow like the religious things and then the, you know, the, all this kind of craziness. It's like, how do you end up following something this blindly? It's like these people, like right now you have crazy inflation issues. You have all this crazy stuff, but Hey, if there's some lunatic screaming at the corner that something X, Y, and Z is, you know, you know, some vision or whatever they have in mind, everyone follows their lead. It makes no sense. I think we all just get drunk on the idea that there's somebody out there that could take a company and 1000 exit And we look like Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos, right? Like these guys were guys that started in their garage or started with humble beginnings and grew these massive empires. I think everyone just gets so intoxicated with the idea that they found the next person to do it. And they probably looked at Adam Newman and he's cool and he walks around barefoot everywhere he goes and he's got crazy hair. And they're like, this guy could be the next Elon Musk. So, I mean, society, we almost do it to ourselves where we think that, just because one guy did it in 30 years ago that there's another guy that's going to do it right now. And we almost turn a blind eye. I I support it. Like, let's, let's get a campaign going for you and some PR. I got to grow it out. (laughs) (laughs) And talking just cliches every time you talk to somebody, (laughs) just cliches. Yeah. (laughs) 
We're 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 gonna be disruptors, guys. We're gonna be disrupting. We're gonna disrupt the industry. We're gonna be the Uber. We're gonna be the Uber of commercial real estate. God bless you, Adam Newman. God bless you. God bless you. Uh, next up is Prologis hopes one day AI will help source this acquisition. So that's kind of interesting. I'm actually gonna be interviewing a gentleman to talk, and I know you have uh, uh, chat as well. Interviewed uh, Mark Duclo. Mark Duclo. Yes, I had the chance to awesome. speak with him on a different podcast, and I know he's been implementing this, but essentially this. You know, they, they kind of start the article by defining what the environment they've been currently in. And then Prologis kind of, and again, not, not just Prologis, this is going to be companies across the board that utilize this technology to kind of help them with their decision-making process. And so they've, they've talked about ways to train models to help them make decisions quicker and more efficiently when it comes to acquisitions. This is something, especially with, with a company like a Prologis that has billions of data points that they can reference creating these 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 technologies that can help amplify their decision making processes is, is, is a no-brainer and it just takes some time but so they were just kind of describing some of the things that they they'd like to have done like hopefully over time they can incorporate into their day-to-day -day operations when it comes to acquisitions and so i don't know you know obviously chad you've had a chance to talk to a few people regarding this information i'm actually going to be interviewing a gentleman who's doing utilizing ai in his brokerage uh business very heavily uh, and that'll be over in may um it should be a really good a discussion so i figured i'd open up to, to the to q a or not q a but discussion yeah i mean the first thing that i'd bring up on this uh is that pro Logis is the biggest real estate owner in the world uh mm -hmm. so not not just industrial real estate they own a billion 1.2 billion square feet of industrial space almost all of it is warehouse logistics space but they're the biggest real estate owner in the world so wh whatever they do makes news and i always look at pro Logis as a bellwether for what's happening in the industry at a whole uh, if you have their level of insight and data and uh, access to different markets, and they're all over the world as well. They're just, whatever, whatever they do is going to come to the market as a whole. With that being said, I think that there's a lot of companies out there right now that are using AI and they're using it through press releases like this one just to sound cool. And perhaps it's to make their investors say, oh, okay, that's good. Are they're going to use AI? Well, maybe that it's a tool that they use at some point down the road to help give a signal saying, based on all this data that we analyzed and what we see going forward, this there's a buy signal here. Maybe. I still think that any investment, especially at the scale that Prologis is doing, they're going to rely so heavily on their internal teams that know these markets intimately. If they're investing in Southern California, which is where they have a good portion of their portfolio, their teams know that market inside and out. They probably also have really close connections with the brokerage community in that entire market. I, I, I own Prologis uh, stock as well, so I am a shareholder in Prologis. As an investor, a very, very small one, I don't want them using AI to make their decisions on buying. I want them to use their in-house expertise combined with outside advice from brokers or consultants or whoever it is, and them synthesizing all that information that's available, all their internal expertise and external expertise, and then making the best decision for the company. To think that you could just off, uh, outsource that to AI and you just plug in the address and some variables and be like, tell us whether we should buy it or not. Like that to me seems incredibly risky. And that just kind of goes back to that comment that I made is that I think AI has become a buzzword where everyone's like, oh, we should talk about AI just because if we don't, if we don't mention AI, our investors are just going to wonder if we're going to get left in the dust. Even though it's, even though AI isn't a game changer, at least nothing that I've seen as of yet, it's a tool it's a very helpful tool and it can help streamline some things, but I don't want to uh, go on to uh, chat GPT and have them draft me up a contract and then think that that replaces a lawyer. I still want to have my lawyer involved in it. So it can streamline things, can make some things more efficient on a bigger scale like Prologis in terms of them going out and analyzing deals. Perhaps it's just that tool. But I, I would just think it'd be incredibly reckless to think that you could rely on AI to make these complex decisions. Yeah, Chad, I'm, I, I'm so happy you brought this up. Okay, because <laughs> I've been I've been wanting to do a video on this for so long, which is the, everyone who just talks about AI, about how it's going to be life changing and like it's all these things. Sure, in a couple years, maybe five, ten years down the road, I think it'll be way better than it is today. But like, it's just like a CRM system. 
Like, why is everybody acting like guys? I'm just like, imagine if imagine if the CEO of Prologis goes on stage and guys, we're using Google Sheets now. Just letting you know, <laughs> we're using Google Sheets. Wanted to make a huge announcement. It's like, who cares, dude? Like, sure, you should use Google Sheets, I guess, whatever. Like, it's like, it's just this stupid thing because all these real estate brokers are going on and they're like, hey, we're an AI driven real estate brokerage. What does that mean right now? Because I have yet to see a AI platform that beyond helping me send emails automatically, maybe texts and a couple auto digi sign, blah, blah, whatever. What the heck are you using AI for right now? Please tell me Cre creating stupid images of dogs riding jet skis and in whatever. I don't know. Like what, what are you using it for in this industry? I'm so freaking curious what everyone is talking about. And hey, by the way, if you guys are watching right now and you have an AI platform that has absolutely changed the way that you're doing your real estate business, comment down below. I will literally take the time to analyze it, buy it, whatever, and do my own take. I'm very curious to see if anybody has really found something because I have yet to find anything. And I've tried a bunch other than something like Air AI, which helps you make cold calls, which, you know, you know, they say they have this crazy, ridiculous conversion ratio, but there's so many people using the server that you can't even make a call. So I don't know, you know, so I, I'm very curious. I think it's, I'm just like you, Chad. I think it's the silliest thing in the world for right now. Yeah. yeah. People are just going to throw money at it for nothing. I, you know, it's, we're still in the early phases. So there's a lot of so testing early. going on with these different processes. And and I know on in your interview with Mark uh, Duclo, you had met, he had mentioned that he's like testing different things out. You, you just kind of, figure out how to incorporate in your business. And, you know, it's a very explorative process, but you know, the, the idea that something like this could benefit you is, is definitely, it's a definitely a reality. Now regarding Prologis, obviously, you know, they're not going to rely completely on making a decision when it comes to just plugging stuff in and then hoping that what it spits out is, is actually going to be the best decision possible. But it can be a great tool, like you had mentioned. I know Ray Dalio uh, at, at his Bridgestone Advisors, they, they have incorporated not necessarily AI, but they've incorporated modeling for making decisions when it comes to buying stocks and bonds and everything else in their investment uh, uh, company. And they've been doing that for like decades. They started back in the 70s. So imagine utilizing, being able to have a model that you you, you incorporate data into over and over and over and over. And you have billions and billions and billions of data points. I mean, that's going to make it so that obviously with with someone that understands how to interpret that data and how to input data properly to be able to support the the logic that is going to benefit you know, you in in your speed to market because really that's what we're trying to do is like you still have to have humans making decisions but if you can outpace your competitor by a factor of two that that over a 10 year period is going to you know that means you're going to crush the competition and it could very well be just even a marginal increase where it's 10% or 5% or whatever but over a 10 year period that's I, that's I agree with that. like listen like I, i'm a huge fan of the modeling right like i've been i've built out incredible underwriting spreadsheets like that are ridiculous to the point where like I'm trying to have it set up where I can be to almost the month or the week of how long I would have to hold an asset of where I would actually have the highest IRR instead of saying like, Oh, over a five-year period, my IRR is 15%, 20, 25%, whatever. I want to find out what week of what month of what year am I, if I sold it during that period of time, I would have the highest IRR, right? By any significant margin, right? And maybe there is, and maybe there is, right? And where I can see where my diminishing returns are. If I hold it any longer than this period of time, I know my IRR is only going to go down. I like modeling, right? But like, please tell me where, you know, is, is there a way where I can plug something into an AI, you know, an AI, whatever, that's all of a sudden going to give me that? I, I would love to know what am I not using? What do I not know about? Yeah, and that's and that's the build. That's the that's the the, the experimental factor right now because you can build. You know, you can have your large language model in the back end supporting all the data you're inputting. But at the end of the day, you have to be able to show, you know, create the system that would support that. Exactly. And so that's, you know, I think maybe the the starting point. There's just a lot of starting points right now. A lot of people are starting to figure out ways to to what the utility is. Just candidly with you guys, I'm, I'm translating all my books into Spanish using AI and sure. it's going to be all it's going to be all audible because I, I speak Spanish. But again, going through the process of going through this you know, the, the, the audible and, and, and reading and all this other stuff. It just takes forever where there's, there's actual platforms out there. Actually, Rod Santamassimo recommended a few to me. And so I'm just going to be leveraging these platforms to convert it over. And now I can convert all the books that I've written into Spanish. And it's going to take me two weeks versus God knows how many months to get it done. So is there, by the way, is there, and again, before we jump off this topic real fast, and I know,
coming up on uh, almost an hour here, but is there an AI platform that either one of you are using right now that you think is unbelievable? I know we talked about place or AI, Raphael, mm -hmm. right? I know we talked yeah. about that one and it looks fairly, you know, it's decent, right? Like I, I obviously don't have the super pro version or whatever, but anything, you know, I've had the pro version of chat GPT pretty much since it's come out. So I, I was a pretty Same. early adopter of that and, and mm -hmm. I like, I use it, I tinker around with it, but I, I found that it just speeds up tasks instead of me having to give it to somebody else to do or me doing it myself you can generate like a really quick email or you can generate a summary of something but it's not that, that to me isn't mind blowing as as mm -hmm. a lot of people are making it seem uh like one cool thing that you could do is write a 500 word essay on the state of the commercial real estate market and it'll pull something reasonably impressive together but it's taking it's it's not developing necessarily anything new it's just it's a large language model as you said so it's taking all the information that's been programmed with all the sources that it has and it's trying to create something out there but i also fear that as it gets more and more used then it becomes very it's almost standardized where I can tell if something's written by G chat GPT now versus if it was just written by a person, or at least I think I can, maybe I'm naive, but I think that I can because it, it comes across very calculated. Like there's, it doesn't have flaws in it. It doesn't have errors. It doesn't have like little mental mistakes that come in. It's almost like perfect language. It's perfect report that comes out. Or it's a perfect essay that comes out. Uh, as opposed to when we all write, we just have our little idiosyncrasies and we have little mistakes or little different ways that you say it, that's gone. There's n none of that in uh, artificially uh, generated anything. So I, I, and I, th I don't know if that ever changes. Uh, and to me, once you strip that away, once you strip past uh, it being able to create simple documents or create text on something, I think the the language one is a really key one. That's probably in my mind the most impressive feature of AI right now. But aside from that, it's still underwhelming based on how and and underwhelming in the sense that it's being pushed so high right now that everybody talks about it being this absolute game changer that's reforming the way that we do everything and it's been built up the tires have been pumped up so high that when you actually really break it down i'm with henry on this one i don't think it's it hasn't significantly changed my business i still hmm. talking to clients i'm still out touring properties the majority of my business is the exact same so i'm skeptical that in the near future it's going to really do a whole lot and i originally had big expectations for it when it first came out i thought this was going to be a game changer i've just tempered my expectations based on exploring it pretty heavy detail and i'm with henry if somebody does have something out there that i haven't seen i'd love to hear it too because i i would love to free up time or be more efficient or more productive and if ai could actually meaningfully do that I'm willing to pay money for it. I just, uh, like Henry, I haven't found a whole lot that's blowing my mind. No, and, and I, I think I agree with you guys as well. And, you know, I'm, I'm again, I, I think what it comes down to is being aware of what's going on around you and trying to experiment here and there. But at the end of the day, it's not going to change the day to day of what we do, because, again, our business is people to people. We're business to business and it's just going to continue to be that way. So <laughs> anyways, guys, I appreciate you, uh, you know, everyone tuning in. This has been fantastic with you guys. I appreciate everybody watching. And uh, other than that, guys, we'll see you guys next Wednesday. Take care, everybody.